Thank you. If I could just start things off with taking a photograph, please. And as a mark of respect, we have telephones off. Thank you. And as another mark of respect, can we please have hats on? Oh. <laughs> Ring the bell. They say that when a person dies, he does not really die until we stop talking about them. I would like to add to that tonight and say you should also not stop, stop talking to them. Andy Jackson, this is the second time you've got me out of retirement to do one of your gigs. <laughs> and your family and many of your friends are here tonight to mark tribute and to celebrate your life and to talk to you and to talk about you. And on that note, I'd like to call upon Big Rob Koff, who will be talking to you, be talking to Andy, and I believe has got a lot to talk about Andy. Up onto the stage. Rob, your 10 minutes starts now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Roger. Um, for those who are at Andy's funeral in Liverpool, you'll know that I could stand up here for, for hours talking about our dear friend Andy Jackson, because there is so much to say. Uh, but you'll be relieved to hear that Andy's family have only allowed me to speak again on the precondition that I cut my tribute just to 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to make a small thank you, actually, to Charge Wanderers for... Um, putting on the central heating early today as well, so it's, uh, it's kept us all comfortable. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today to say farewell to Andy and to mourn his death and also to celebrate his remarkable life. None of us could have imagined we would have been gathered here saying goodbye to Andy in such tragic and heartbreaking circumstances. On behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank all of the Jackson family for their thoughtfulness and fortitude in organizing this memorial evening to allow those who could not be in Liverpool to say farewell to Andy. For Andy's family, including Jim and Doreen who can't be with us today, Vanessa and Ben, Jeff and Suzanne, and Julie and Bill, it is comforting for them to know that he touched so many hearts. A week before Andy's funeral, I travelled up to Liverpool to meet with Andy's parents, Jim and Doreen, and his sister Julie. And we had an emotional lunch together, sharing stories of Andy. Talking with Jim about days in Uganda and later in Malawi from the 1960s, it reminded me of Andy's stories about his childhood in Africa. When I first met Andy, we were both youthful 18-year-olds, and he loved talking about his times in Africa, and to me it sounded so adventurous and exotic. I came away from their home feeling comforted and talking with Jim was just like talking with my friend Andy. It was easy, it was funny, and it was meaningful. Andy was a very good all-round sportsman, and he excelled at most sports, hockey, tennis, squash, football, and rugby. He ran, he cycled, jogged, skied, he kayaked around the Musendam. He abseiled, he scuba dived, and he scaled mountains, and he crossed deserts. He drank drinks to the regiment, and he ran marathons dressed as an Arabian leopard. His escapades on Raid Galois expeditions are all the stuff of legend. Andy approached all of his sports the same way he approached life itself. Play hard, play fair, play with skill, use your brain, play to win and play to make friends. Quite a few people here will have met him through playing rugby and also through his chairmanship of his cherished barrel house. As a rugby player, Andy was very competitive. He was courageous and he had a great rugby brain. He could tackle players twice his size by taking them out at ankle height with little thought of injury to himself. 
and his chairmanship of Barrel House is of legendary status, and it was his baby. His unique charisma and dogged determination saw it grow and grow. And the pink theme grew and grew under Andy's guidance, and hats for each Rugby Sevens became a challenge for him until he settled on his favourite Tilly hat. And it's here with us tonight. Under Andy's expert guidance, Barrel House quite rightly became known as a drinking club with a serious rugby problem. <laughs> if you were ever in trouble or in a seriously bad place and needed help, then Andy would be the man you would want to know. In my life, I've been in a few dark places at times, and his support was all-encompassing, loyal, and unquestioned. You always had the feeling he would see things through to the end, and for me, he did just that. For those of you who are not in the um, who were not in Liverpool at Andy's funeral, the crematorium chapel was overfilled to capacity with people standing outside in the car park. I stood in the car park before the funeral started and watched as people from Andy's present and distant, distant past appeared. Andy's funeral was as sorrowful and as heartbreaking as anyone can imagine. And yet I came away from it and reflected that he had had a tremendous send-off. Tears flowed and they mixed with smiles and laughter, and later on some very dodgy dancing. <laughs> with friendships I've always favoured quality over quantity, and with Andy I was lucky enough to find a lifelong friend. I know that there are also many other people here today who consider themselves as fortunate as I to have met him and been able to enjoy his friendship. Now that he has left us, I will not look to replace him. Instead, I will find comfort in a wealth of great memories. And I will also look at Ben and see in Ben parts of Andy. Andy was always attempting to wind me up about my Welshness and Andy would constantly tease my children about their Welshness and he was relentless in secretly offering Saren, Tyrion and Griff an English passport. <laughs> he said that he knew people who could arrange it, that he could get them an English passport. After I had mentioned this at the funeral in Liverpool, in the tribute there, Ben came up to me after the funeral and as quick as a flash said, look Rob, I can arrange those English passports for your children. <laughs> like father, like son. For some bizarre reason, not known to either of us, Andy and I shared a passion for very amateur carpentry, which created the masterpieces of the Running Horses Bar and later the hut at Hamaria Beach. Both had a common theme. During construction, we never used one nail when three or four could be hammered in. And after construction, we never had one drink when three or four could be fitted in. <laughs> on hearing of Andy's accident, I wanted his spot on a distant highway in Michigan to be marked with flowers. And so I asked Cynthia to place flowers at the scene. Black and white for the Dubai exiles. Red and black for the Sharjah wanderers. And of course, pink for Barrel House. The simple message read, the past has been bottled and labelled with love. Many of us here are parents and bringing up children, we try and do our best to equip them for adult life. And I'd let, just like to say, as I said at the tribute in Liverpool, Andy's parents, Doreen and Jim, had done an incredible job with Andy. He was truly a unique human being. In turn, I believe that both Vanessa and Andy have done the same great job with Ben as he embarks on his journey into adult life. Ben has shown remarkable courage since his father passed away. And Andy would have been so proud of you, Ben, and how you stood up at his funeral 
and shared some of your memories with us with such love, humour and composure. Andy would also no doubt have been very impressed with the way you helped lead the wake along with Jeff and Julie after the funeral. I loved the way that you held hold of your dad's uh, iPad in the hotel afterwards and we played his music all night long in the bar of the hotel that we were staying at. We sang the Sharjah Wanderers Ball led by Uncle Bobby Woods and as the evening turned to late night and then early morning and yet after yet another table had been sent crashing to the floor with drinks all over the place. A barman in the, in the hotel came out with a classic line to Ben. He said, hey mate, I'm going to have to close the bar soon, otherwise we'll have no friggin' furniture left. <laughs> I first met your dad, Ben, through a simple game of football way back in Liverpool College in 1977. And over the last few years, I'd been pestering Andy to come and play football for the Sharjah Fat Old Boys. And finally, about nine months ago, he turned up and played, and he loved it. And he was then a re regular on Wednesday nights for the Fat Old Boys. Then when you finished school and you came back from South Africa, and you came back to Sharjah, and turned up on the Wednesday nights and played football with your dad. I tell you, he could not have been happier. He never missed a Wednesday night when you were back in town. Just a few weeks before he died, I remember you passing, pushing the ball past your dad on the wing and then him scurrying along and slide tackling you and just scything you down with her. And he just held his hands up and apologised. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Are you okay? You're just too fast for me, mate. <laughs> I'm not sure if you realise this, Ben, but uh, at 18 years of age, I can now bestow on you the title of Honorary Sharjah Wanderer's Fat Old Boy. <laughs> and he was so proud of you, Ben, and your achievements, and he was so pleased that you were heading to university to study geology. When you head to university in the next couple of weeks, I hope you meet somebody like Andy. Meeting him changed my life. And I will be forever thankful to have shared time with such a wonderful friend. Andy loved to go on journeys. And this last one he has made has taken several weeks to cover many thousands of miles. From a highway in Michigan, to his birthplace in Omskirk in Liverpool. And from there onwards to Sharjah to be with us all here tonight. Soon he will head out into the desert which he enjoyed so much, where his ashes will be carried up a very steep mountain. Very, very steep mountain, Jeff. Near, near to Fossil Rock, to a wonderful final resting place that Ben has chosen. And there, Andy will rest in peace. Thank you very much.